Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. The Apostle John wrote about love. This is that, that day of love. And he said in 1 John, Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. Pretty, pretty huge uh, responsibility that we get to represent the love of God to the world that needs to know that God is love. So if we have never met before, my name is Joni Schilling. I'm one of the pastors here. Delighted to welcome everyone here in person and those of you that are joining us online. If you are joining online, please fill out the connection card and let us know that you are here. Let us know of any prayer concerns that you have. You are in for a treat this morning as we have special guests to bring our message this morning. We have our partners in ministry. You've heard of Mosaic. You'll hear more about it today. But our partners in ministry, David and Kelly Kaiser, are here to sit up here and talk with Pastor Russ and help us better understand the work that they're doing in South Toledo. So we are so grateful that they um, are going where God has called them to be and that we get to be a part of that work. So now let us worship God. For those of you that are worshiping with us here, please stand if you feel comfortable in doing so. For those of you that at home, uh, whatever position that you need to be in to worship, it's a heart statement, not a physical statement. Let's sing this one. Make it count, leave a mark, build a name for yourself. Dream your dreams, chase your heart above all else. Make a name the world remembers. An empty world can sell its empty dreams I got lost in the light when it was up to me To make a name the world remembers Jesus is the only name to remember Did 
My name is Carrie, for those of you that don't know. That last lyric troubles me greatly. I don't care if they remember me, only Jesus. It troubles me because I want to be remembered. Hear the human statement in that. And as we stand here or the first time back in a long time or what it feels like a long time, I find that there are greats that have stood in this place. And I mean Zach for one. And that makes him uncomfortable. And Zach, I know you're taking a, a well-deserved rest, so thank you, brother. God be with you. God be with all of us in this time of discomfort. In the time of wrestling with lyrics of our humanness of pandemics. So let's let's just go to the Lord this morning, shall we? Feels a little weird to be out of practice, Lord. And you know what I mean by that. That's more a performance statement than it is a heart statement. Prayer, in my view, has always been a conversation. So here's the conversation, Lord. What strikes me this week is what we have been invited to pray as a congregation in our FYI mailing, our Friday mailings. That this week our staff was in a training session online and our congregation was invited to, to pray abide. Just hold that word, hold that thought. I love is in our discomfort and our humans and our holiness and you know what I mean by that Lord you are always there you are the never changing element of this equation we are the ones that drift close and far that are challenged sometimes because of our humanness and challenged even because of our holiness sometimes we see a glimpse of you in our thoughts and our words and our actions and our deeds Thank you for building us a home, an eternal home. And thank you for walking with us in this broken world. Together we say thank you and together all God's people say.
I have a home Eternal home Above and now And walk this broken world You walked it first You know our pain You show us hope Can rise again up from the grave Abide with me Abide with me Don't let me fall Don't let go Walk with me Never leave Ever close Gotta abide with me putting the lyrics of the chorus up one more time. It felt like that needed to be sung one more time because whatever the prayer brought up for you is in our humanness or our holiness. Let's just lift that to our Father this morning. It's not ours to hold on to and make ourselves be bad or, oh my goodness, let's let go this morning, shall we? Abide with me. One, two, three. morning. Our children's message is for the children online and the child in all of us. And today we celebrate love. Valentine's Day is all about love. And we think about the love between a couple most often. But the love that we celebrate on Valentine's Day should be the love between all of us, between our friends, between child and parent. It should be the love between each one of us. We can celebrate Valentine's when we tell others that we love them by saying, I love you. We can celebrate Valentine's when we show others by what we give them. 
Maybe we take them out to eat, or we give them a nice gift, or we let them pick the movie instead of always getting to do it ourselves. On Valentine's, we can show others we love them by what we do for them. Maybe we cook them lunch, or we clean the house without them asking. Or maybe we write them a nice note and tell them of our appreciation for them. There are so many great ways to show others that we appreciate and love them on Valentine's. We can tell them, we can give them things, we can show them. And when we think of love, we often think of the symbol of love. Many of you wore your red today, and we think of that big red heart to symbolize Valentine's Day and love. But the true symbol of love is the cross. In Romans 5.8, it says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for for us while we were still sinners. That is the ultimate act of love. When we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The ultimate picture of what love really looks like. The greatest love we could ever ask for. So while you celebrate love today, though it may be an imperfect love, love each other with all that you have, but remember that the greatest love you will ever know comes from God. Would you bow your head and pray with me? Dear God, help us to understand what love means and help us to practice it with those around us, even when it's difficult and even when we don't feel like it. But help us to also remember that there is no greater love than the love you have for us. Thank you for the love of Jesus. And all of God's children said, Amen. Well, thank you, Bethany. Good morning. My name is... Good morning. My name is Russ Titchener. I'm one of the pastors here at Mama United Methodist Church, and we are kind of changing our uh, stage around here a little bit. I'm going to invite a couple of friends of mine, uh, David and and, and Kelly Kaiser, to come up, and we are going to sanitize a couple of uh, of, uh, mics, get those going, and uh, and we're going to have a talkback session this morning. Oh, you got them? I'm sorry. Here, I could have grabbed them before you grabbed them. Gosh, I'm not a very good host, am I? I'm immune. I should I should shake your hand with this too, and and I could just hear I could just do just uh, totally sanitize you here. Well, I am so glad you are here. I've been looking forward to this uh, this uh, day for quite a while. We had uh, started. Um, in fact, I'll tell a story. Um, I may I'll just sneak in the story now. About two and a half years ago, David had taken me to lunch, and and uh, we had a lunch, and we committed as a church. Uh, to raising some money for um, Mosaic Ministries, as you know, or you may not know if you're online, many of you may not know what we do at Mosaic Ministries if you're new to our church. Um, We have been in relationship with David and Kelly for probably, I've been here six years, Uh, Scott was here nine, and probably the first couple years that he was here, so probably um, 12, 13, 14 years. Uh, It was uh, Lido Lanes in the basement of the bowling alley that we served. And today, Lido Lanes is no longer there. It's either a Dollar General or a um, just recently built in that neighborhood. And uh, and so it's been a long journey with uh, with this with this ministry, which has uh, certainly been a blessing. To, I know to our congregation uh, and to the people of South Toledo, uh, which is where uh, Mosaic Ministry is focused on. And so uh, in that conversation that I had with David, he was asking for a commitment, uh, and we'll talk about that commitment a little bit later, and I agreed to that commitment. And so we're kind of seeing two and a half years later, the, um, he gave me kind of a three-year window. I guess I'm kind of a procrastinator, right, you know? And, uh, but we're going to make that. We're going to make that three-year window. So um, if he would have given me a six-month window, he could have had all of this done six months or, or uh, two years ago, right? So, yeah. Um, but we are so glad you're here today. And let's take a moment. Let's pray, and then we'll move into our talk back session. Heavenly Father, there are just special people in your life that you come across, and uh, David and Kelly are two of those people that you just remember, as uh, Carrie was saying. It's not about remembering them or us, it's about remembering you. And, and perhaps the reason we remember David and Kelly 
It's because we see you in their heart and in their ministry. And isn't that a great reason to be remembered? And so today, Lord, help us to unpack the ministry that they're a part of. Many of us know it well. Some of us the first time in hearing about it. And how we can continue to walk beside them in this walk as we walk with Mosaic uh, in this time of, in this season of Lent. And so bless us. We love you and we pray this in your name. Amen. So why don't we uh, get just maybe a little bit of history um, for those of, of us who maybe do not know. Um, maybe you're part of the church and, and you've, you've heard of Mosaic, but you really don't know what they do. Um, or perhaps it's the first time being online and, and you've never heard of Mosaic. And so you say, hmm, wonder what that is. And because when I think of Mosaic, I think of like a, a mosaic painting, a, a, a stained glass window. I, it's probably more than that, right? Sure. Yeah. 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 So Kel and I started about 14 years ago. Um, I, there was this experience I had that uh, I really felt God impressing on me that, to get involved in urban ministry. And um, I wanted to get away from that. I wanted to be like a Jonah and run away from that. And so uh, I was away. I was out of town when I really felt impressed with this. And so I called Kelly and hoping that she would try to talk me out of it, but rather talk me out of it uh, when I said, hey, honey, I feel like God's calling us to urban ministry. How do you feel about that? She said, oh, yeah, I felt that same way for three years, and every time I feel it, I just tell God, if that's really what you want us to do, make sure David feels that too. <laughs> so me being the spiritual giant that I am, I said one word in response, and that word was nuts. <laughs> uh, because urban ministry is about as far away from our, our childhood as you could get. Uh, we're both country kids. Kelly grew up uh, in a suburb of Defiance. Defiance is 16,000 people. She grew up outside of Ayersville, Ohio. Uh, and I grew up on a, uh, not really a farm, we had cows, so I had to feed cows before I could go off to high school, and I couldn't see my neighbor. So working in an urban setting was like the last thing, which is how we were pretty sure it was God's call. And um, so we were initially uh, very afraid of this neighborhood. It was a, an old uh, 1880s building, someone had stopped caring for it, probably 1920s, uh, was falling apart. Uh, I was telling the other group that we'd have to shovel our pews when it snowed because there were so many cracks in this building. It was coming down. It was an old church building, right? The whole church okay. building okay. was coming down. Yeah, you could see the daylight from the kitchen, and, <laughs> and uh, we were diligent about patching up our holes every time we'd find one, but uh, I remember frequently shoveling off a pew, so yeah. uh, wow. we had to do that here, probably no, not so much. No, praise the Lord, we do not have to do that here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so God called us to the specific ministry. It was uh, Western Avenue Baptist Church. We haven't been on Western Avenue since we tore that building down about 2010, and uh, people keep showing up there, so we thought, well, we better change our name. And uh, a friend of ours, our, our music leader actually, said, uh, you know, Mo Mosaic would be a great name. And, and so it really is uh, broken pieces, uh, broken people that form something beautiful in the hands of our master. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and so that's why it's named Mosaic now instead it. of Western Avenue. First time Kelly and I pulled up there to kind of visit. Um, we were scared to death. We actually pulled our car parallel with the front door and, and uh, synchronized uh, when we would open our door and then dash inside. And it was all the distance from here from the piano. So it was, you know, it was kind of strange. And um, now our, our guests that are there know us so well, the neighborhood knows us so well that uh, we can walk up and down the sidewalk and people greet us by name. So uh, it's been quite a change. And along the way, we've had an unbelievable number of experiences. Um, but one of the ones that Russ asked me to re re repeat was the, we met this young man or older man named Dennis. And uh, Dennis lived in an apartment nearby and would come out for our meals at our place. And one day he came in and he had um, uh, bags over his socks inside of his boots. And uh, I saw that and I said, Dennis, what's, what's up with the bags? And he said, well, I, I lost my apartment. They actually tore the building down. And uh, I said, well, where are you staying? He goes, well, there's an abandoned house over on South Avenue and I'm, I'm staying there. And we're really heartbroken for Dennis. He's kind of frail and uh, probably 20 years older than we are. And, and uh, that night, Kelly was in bed and I was getting ready for bed and I, I was telling her about it. I said, hey, I had a conversation with Dennis today and I told her what happened and she kind of got uh, that scoldy voice that uh, I almost never hear. Um, <laughs> and it was, uh, how do, and she said these words, uh, how in the world can you get in this nice warm bed and know that Dennis, our friend Dennis is sleeping in an abandoned house? You need to go down there and find him like right now. You know, that wasn't the way you told it when I first told it. You said, um, you it, said to Kelly, said, you're not getting this bed with me as long as he's out there on the street. That's what, that's what, yeah. you, I think that's what she really said. That was the clear message, yeah. <laughs> so it was 1130 at night, you know, in the middle of a, it was a real cold snap that year. And so I drove down there and uh, just, I didn't know where he was. I didn't know what abandoned house. I didn't know what, you know, which house at all. And uh, so I just prayed, God, you know, help me find Dennis. And it wasn't 30 seconds after I prayed. I turned onto a side street and uh, I saw someone stand in the corner. It was really dark that night and I couldn't see who it was, but I, I thought maybe that's him. So I rolled down the window and I said, hey, Dennis. And he's like, hey, Pastor Dave, what's you doing? 
<laughs> and I said, I thought you were living in an abandoned house. And he goes, yeah, it's that one over there. But uh, he said, I can't go in until the people on either side turn out their lights because if they see me go in there, they call the cops and I get thrown out. I mean, just think of the indignity. You're already living in an abandoned house and uh, then you can't even slip in there until it's late at night. So I told Dennis, go get your stuff. And uh, we moved him in my office and he slept on a couch in my office for about two years. So wow. Uh, wow. we were really motivated to help him find an apartment after that. So. <laughs> So that's a little bit about the ministry. And one of the things that we learned right away, like we went down there with a, a we realized later with a kind of a wrong attitude. And the attitude was we're going to go down and help these people. And boy, within the first two weeks, we had all kinds of challenges. And then we realized we're really down there because God wanted to help us. Uh, so we helped the people. But we also think that 50-50, it's a ministry to people in the South Toledo. And it's a ministry to you here in this room as well because you get involved. And uh, before I turn it back to Russ, let me just say, uh, I don't even know how to say thank you enough to this congregation. In fact, I've got some numbers. I'm going to steal them from you, Russ. Is that okay? okay. Right. Uh, you guys, when the pandemic hit, we lost a bunch of support, but um, you called and said, whatever you need, we'll fill it. And so since that time, you've done 16,940 meals. That's a very specific number, about 17,000 meals. This one I love, uh, 37,770 cookies. So that's I think a, I might have had a couple. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what? You know the cool thing about those, though? They need to be quality inspected when they come in. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm the guy that'll do that. Yeah. 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 Some tough them, job. Yeah, tough job. The ones that came in yesterday were uh, Valentine's themed, so my daughters all got a uh, cookie, so thank you for that. Yeah. They thought I was a really nice dad, but uh, thank you for making it easy for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and thank you for the diabetes, too. 37,000 cookies. <laughs> yeah. so. Uh, just kidding, just kidding. And then uh, 1,120, that's 1,120 bags of groceries just since last March. Nobody else. I mean, we have a lot of supporters in Toledo, a lot of churches that support us, but nobody's come even close to what this congregation has done. So we're very grateful for that. Oh, well, it's an honor. It's an honor to be in relationship. And I truly mean that. Every time, um, and you've said that, uh, that God is showing you how to truly live uh, by being in that space. And I think that's what Mosaic has been for, for us, is you get down and you make friends uh, and, and things that we may take for granted, um, we find people down there do not. And it's like, oh my goodness. And, uh, and so there, I think God's showing us how to live and more open-handedly, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, uh, oftentimes you'll go down there for, uh, and I found this in serving people who um, sometimes are on the margins, uh, are so generous with what they have to share. And uh, it's like, oh, help me to be more generous. So, so it's really cool to see that. So it's an honor to be in relationship with you and in ministry with you. And uh, so a little bit, so we had, we had talked about kind of a little bit of the background, the history, how you got there. There's a, um, there is a, uh, a, a, a movie, uh, it's probably about 20 minutes, something like that, 25 minutes, uh, that was made last November. I think it was released by Mosaic. Uh, the movie was called Every Seed Has a Story. And, and we're going to release this movie uh, this coming Wednesday because we're going to do a kickoff called Walk with Mosaic uh, starting on uh, Ash Wednesday. And on Ash Wednesday, so this coming Wednesday, we'll, we'll launch that movie so you can watch it. It'll be on our website. It'll be on an email to you and also on Facebook. Uh, and, and you'll kind of have a backstory. But I thought as we looked at the current focus of the ministry, let's, let's start off with this clip. And it's only about, I think, a little over a minute. And we'll look at this clip and then you can maybe respond to this clip. Have you ever realized what you thought was normal growing up wasn't? My normal isn't your normal. I did not choose this, yet here we are. Can you talk? Sure. Every fear, every laugh, every moment. Why do I have to wear this? Because you just have to, Mia, okay? Trust me. Life is defined by moments. Moments give birth to stories. I have half a dozen people who don't even have a house to stay in tonight. You're gonna have to wait your turn. My story is defined by the chairs I've sat in. Many families struggle to break the cycle of poverty. Children born in poverty have a 17% chance of getting out in their lifetime. 
See what you can do to help break the cycle. BeatPovertyToledo.com So, so Kelly, maybe you can talk about the, that chair thing and, and how that affects maybe your current ministry, where you're at in your ministry, how you look at that, and maybe seek some background. Right, right. So the movie's called Every Seat Has a Story. And um, if you think about a school, all the chairs in a school, every child occupying, occupying those seats has a story, has uh, something they had to go through in order to just get to that school. Um, the statistic that she quoted, um, a child born in South Toledo has just a 17% chance of getting out of poverty in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. So um, that really struck us. And the first few years of our ministry, we were feeding people and we were like so excited. This is great. We're feeding people. But we got to know the kids and the little families and um, realized these kids were not going to have the opportunities that our kids were having. Um, and that this was a cycle we were going to watch go round and round. If we're, if we're going to serve 20 years in South Toledo, we're going to be feeding those kids' kids uh, pretty soon. Mm -hmm. So um, we decided we really did not want to do that. We wanted to do something that was effective and that would last and that would bring about a real change. So um, we have adopted the Harlem Children's Zone model, which is kind of creating a cradle-to-career or cradle-to-purpose pipeline so we want to follow these families, not just give them food, but um, engage in a relationship with them. Um, we have Baby University, which teaches the best, parent, best practices in parenting, coming alongside parents and teaching them what um, they weren't taught um, as children. Because what better gift can you give a child than a parent who knows how to take care of them? Your parents are your most influential person in your life. And, um, giving that child that gift, a parent who can take care of them is wonderful. And then feeding these families through a preschool. Um, kids in South Toledo are 81% behind on their first day of kindergarten because of the stress of poverty and um, not hearing enough words. So we help parents um, uh, learn how to read to their kids and provide them with books. But also preschool is very effective. Um, we're going to launch a new preschool in the fall in our current building. When we had a preschool, um, the kids were 100% kindergarten ready. So, and then uh, feed... So feed, from this 83% behind, yes. because of baby you, then by the time they started in there, they were 100% ready. Right, okay. right. So that's exciting. They, these pro there are big problems, but, but we can do something about them. And, um, and then we'll follow uh, these families through with the charter school. We have an agreement with the charter school through eighth grade so far. So, but the, the main thing is having a relationship with these families. We have outreach workers that meet with them monthly, um, connecting them to safe housing, mental health, um, health care services, food, anything that they might need so that their families can be stable and the kids can stay in school and learn. Yeah. Um, some of our outcomes, real quick, um, the premature birth rate in South Toledo is 30%. 30% of all births in South Toledo are premature, which blows my mind. Mm -hmm. um, but for baby U families, it's 17%. Wow. Um, same with low birth weight. Um, it's about a third um, of what the uh, neighborhood average is. So we know that coming alongside these families, and it's not really rocket science, it's more just walking with them and having that relationship and um, sharing what, what the community has for them. I remember the first time I ever was uh, in Baby U, um, is, and I did this several years ago, we had uh, uh, had a bunch of blankets, I think, blankets, uh, gloves, hats, and we were taking it down, and you were teaching, and I, and I walked in, and I thought I'd see a few women. That's, that was my <laughs> perception, right? You walk in, there's dads and moms and everybody. It was packed. The room was packed. I went, whoa! And uh, all just energetic and excited. And, and so, so I remember, David, last time you came and talked, something maybe you does, or, or teaching parents how to be parents. Um, I can remember you said that they don't know how to discipline. And, and I can remember telling this to someone else after you had already told me how, what, what the outcome of that was. Uh, and the person I was talking to said, yeah, they don't discipline their kids well downtown uh, or in a, in a poverty-stricken area. They need to discipline uh, uh, better. And they were saying they need to be stricter. And I said, no, 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 no. said, when we discipline, we give a timeout. When they discipline, they grab the kid and they start one of these things. So it's just the opposite oftentimes of what we're thinking. You're, right. you're starting square one 
in taking a child uh, who has grown up to become a parent to say this is not the way you discipline your kid and teaching that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, right. And that's, that's really the nature of uh, poverty. So I had a little dialogue with some folks online last week and they said, well, people in poverty are just dumb and they make bad decisions and they're all on drugs. And I said, man, I, it's something I really like. And I said, I got to tell you, that's really not the case. Yeah. So that may be the case in some situations, but the folks that we're working with are four or five generations of poverty. Uh, Kelly talked earlier about a girl, she didn't mention her, but there was a girl we met our first week who was 13 and pregnant. And she asked Kelly to go through labor and delivery with her. And Kelly said, you know, 13 years from now, we'd be feeding that new baby's new baby. And that was really what drove us to find some other solution. So it's generational poverty. <clears throat> what we find is our parents don't know what they don't know. And uh, when we start, when she leads these classes and teaches them, you can see them. The first day they come in, they're kind of surly and uh, not real compliant. And after two or three weeks, they're smiling, they're sitting up, they're engaged. Because these are things they can do. There's three things that uh, numerous studies have shown. If you do from birth to five years old, that kid will not be the 81% behind. And by the way, it's 81% behind other uh, middle class kids in the same district. So think about a kid in Old Orchard versus a kid in South Toledo. There's an 81% gap on the first day a public school teacher sees that child. But you can erase those three things, or erase that deficit with three things. Read to the child for 15 minutes a day, every day. It's half a sitcom. Get the child appropriate medical care, and then what Russ was talking about, uh, learn to discipline in productive ways. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. So you've, you've landed then with this new way of doing this probably not too long after you started, right, to say we've got to fix the bigger problem of poverty and, and the things associated with that. And one of your dreams has been to go into a new building that will help to do that, help f facilitate the, uh, the ministry even more. Is that, yeah. tell us a yeah. little bit about that. So we bought a building, you'll see uh, some pictures of it here in a second. Uh, we bought it for $9,500. Uh, uh, it's a great story, but I don't have time to tell you now. Um, and so when you buy a building, it's 27,000 square feet for less than 10 grand. It gives you an idea what kind of condition it was in. And so our dream has been to restore that building. Uh, we've made some progress, thanks to a number of people here in this congregation, actually. And um, we want to move in there, hopefully as uh, soon as later this year. Uh, the ministry will move in there, and then we want to add on to that building a, 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 an addition that will be a charter school. Uh, there's 1,200 kids in the neighborhood. There's uh, three schools in the neighborhood, and they hold about 800 kids. So there's 400 kids that have to leave the neighborhood every day to get an education. We want to have them grow up in this neighborhood. We want to stabilize these families. And so we help with housing and food and everything else that they need. We say it's holistic. And then we want to be there for the longitudinal part of, like Kelly said, from cradle to purpose. So the new building will host uh, us as well as a charter school. And then we're hoping you know, a, a gym like this is part of the building. Uh, we hope to have programming there five or six nights a week for kids. It's a very dangerous neighborhood for children. Uh, we live about a mile from here, and within a mile from our house, there's four registered sex offenders. From within a mile of the ministry, there's 44, so mm -hmm. 10 times. Yeah. So we want to give kids a safe place to get off the streets and uh, encounter Jesus and uh, grow up in a healthy community. Okay. Well, let's take a look at this second uh, clip. It's about four minutes long, but I think it's worthwhile. Let's look at this. Over 100 years ago, a home for the fraternal organization known as the International Order of Oddfellows was built in the historic South Toledo neighborhood. The Oddfellows named this new structure as the Viking Lodge. The lodge became a place for growing middle class residents of the area to gather, to enjoy one another, and relax. Their stated mission was to provide resources for widows and orphans, although it seems like having fun was a high priority as well. When the building went up, it reflected the rising tide of the neighborhood. One of the first suburban areas of the city, developers advertised the infrastructure and gas availability in South Toledo as reasons to locate there. But as happens to all things, the building eventually deteriorated. The membership declined and the neighborhood along with it. In the centuries since someone cut a ribbon in front of it, the lodge structure faded into abandonment after becoming a rough bar and then sitting unused for over 20 years. But today, the neighborhood and the structure are both undergoing a needed revitalization effort, thanks to residents and others forming new organizations, including Mosaic Ministries, the Broadway Corridor Coalition, and the Historic South Initiative. Together, a neighborhood plan has been developed, 
Over 100 abandoned homes have been demolished and nearly 100 more have been rehabbed. The block of buildings containing the Viking Lodge are the last commercial block in the neighborhood to receive some much needed attention. But that is changing. Mosaic purchased this 27,000 square foot building for less than $10,000. It had been stripped of anything of value inside. The building sat completely vacant for 16 years, collecting dust, cobwebs, and despair. Yet the area organizations and residents are uniting to bring this magnificent structure back to useful life. It will soon be the home of Mosaic Ministries and Baby University, as well as a safe place for hundreds of neighborhood kids to come learn, play, and grow. Mosaic plans to run family-oriented programming in the facility seven days per week, 16 hours per day, including a preschool to prepare children for academic success. Collectively, we are making an impact on poverty in Toledo's Old South End. We are seeing incredible reductions in premature births, kindergarten readiness, and family stability. Our current programming is now space limited, resulting in our need to rehabilitate this building. A 1916 news article described the total cost of the building as costing a substantial sum of 50,000. Today's plans tell us we need about three million to return this building to its former glory. A future goal of adding an elementary school will require additional investment of at least the same amount. However, Mosaic Ministries, Baby University, and the Historic South Initiative are currently seeking community investments of three million with one third of that already raised. Due to the COVID pandemic, it is challenging to get folks to tour the facility. We hope to see the Toledo community make investments in those who are economically, emotionally, and spiritually deprived. Together, we can beat poverty if we focus on breaking the generational patterns that lead to South Toledo kids having just a 17% chance of escaping it. The science shows it can be done if we start with the earliest possible stages of life. Would you please consider helping us with the plan to restore this building, the children and the neighborhood to a better future? Okay, so um, that brings us kind of up to date where we had this lunch, we committed to it. Uh, I took that to Ad Board. Ad Board uh, fully committed to this last year uh, to uh, raising funds for, uh, did I ever mention the number? I don't think I did. So raising $20,000, that's what we're looking to do in six weeks. Um, the, uh, and I think it's very, very doable. Uh, just so you know, $10,000 has already been committed for a match. So every dollar that we give, somebody else is giving a dollar up to that $10,000 amount. So, so uh, if you give $20, then it's $40. If you give $50, then it's $100. So, so, um, so what we're striving to do, starting on Wednesday, we will have a, uh, a program starting to roll out a lot of different ways as far as how do we, how do we um, um, uh, over this six-week time frame, how do we uh, do some sacrificial giving uh, through the congregation? Um, and, and we'll talk about different ways we can give. Uh, one thing, and we're doing this coupled, right? We are continuing to support the ministry. Whenever we, on Sunday morning, we don't do it so much at this service, but at the traditional service, we'll, we'll pray for our tithes and our offerings, our tithes in the Old Testament. And, and when you look at uh, most churches, when they say tithes and offerings, still follow that same pattern. When we look at the tithes, we're looking at uh, contributions that are made to the church. Uh, and then offerings were in the Old Testament, anything above the tithe, right? And so that was given. Uh, so I would urge you to continue to support the ministries of this uh, congregation first. I think that's most important. Uh, and, and then uh, this is on top of that. Uh, right now, and I mention that because last year we had an incredible year. We went through a pandemic. We put this out a lot, a lot of thank yous for this. We were almost... Um, even last year's giving with the year before, which I find amazing to go through a pandemic to have almost the exact same amount given the year before, which is amazing and wonderful. And we've uh, sent out many thank yous on that. Um, this year, however, in the first six weeks of this year, our, our giving's uh, down. Uh, and so enough so that I'm mentioning that. So I would really encourage you to, to continue to support the ministries here at Mommy United Methodist Church, which helps us then jump out to help Mosaic. Uh, so do that first. And then on top of that, look for ways that you can do some sacrificial giving to say, on top of supporting the ministries of Mommy United Methodist Church, I'm going to embrace this six-week Lenten season uh, and give sacrificially. Lent is that 40 days that mimics Jesus' being in the desert. 
where he gave up food, and when it, where he gave up uh, eating and, and really water. And so for this miraculous 40-day period, uh, give up so that, uh, that we could eventually have, right? And so that's what we're asking you to do. Michelle and I, and I'll give you an example. Everybody could give different levels, and some may not choose to do this at all. I understand that too, and that's fine. But if you do choose, make it sacrificial. Like Michelle and I, for someone, that may be $5 a week. For you, that's really tough to do. Uh, that would be sacrificial giving. Uh, Michelle and I looked and said, what would hurt at least some, right? So what, are, what would hurt to enough to give up? So we decided $100 a week for us would be something we'd have to give something else up. Uh, and so we will give $100 a week and continue to do that through the season of Lent for that six weeks. Uh, and so that's the way I'm, I'm asking everybody to look at this. We could, you could do one check, you could do one donation, but I would urge you to do something every day. In some, you may go to Starbucks, $5 at Starbucks, and you say, you know, I go four times a week, I'm going to give up that, that $5 four times a week so that we're getting in step with Mosaic. It's truly a walk with Mosaic. And so there would be three ways to give. You could go to the website and click on giving, and it brings up a Tithely app. Uh, and when you go there, there's three different ways you can give in the tithely app, either to the church as general funds, or to the Family Life Center paying this building off, or it just says other. If you click down and do other, then anything that comes in in the six weeks during Lent and other will go towards Mosaic Ministry. Uh, the other way, you can write a check, drop it off at the church, drop it off at an offering basket on, on Sunday morning, but you'll need to put in the memo line for Mosaic. The other way you can do it is we started a GoFundMe account, uh, and I think most of you are familiar with that. I think John has a picture of it here. This is what it would look like. We'll send out a link on Wednesday uh, in which you can go to the GoFundMe account. Michelle and I will go into the GoFundMe account once a week. And we're going to make ours publicly known. You don't have to. We're just doing that to say we're committed to this. And I think if we're asking you to be committed to it, we should be committed to it. And so you'll see that every week that we'll go there once a week and we'll put $100 in through the... Uh, for, through the um, uh, what did I just call this thing? GoFundMe account. The other thing that's cool about the GoFundMe account, and you'll see it on Facebook, uh, and we'll send this out, uh, is that you can send it to your friends. So I'll send this as a link to my family, uh, to my mom, to my brother and sister. I know they'll give too. So it's really a wonderful way to, uh, to use your sphere of influence to send this out. Uh, and it'll be surprising how many people will, will, will respond to that. So the other ways you can give, uh, if it's not financially, you can give to sign up. We, we pack groceries every month here. We cook. Uh, as, as David said, we have like 17,000 meals that have been cooked since, since um, March. Uh, we're looking to put together another uh, cooking team together. Uh, we can um, uh, go down and serve in person. Uh, we can bake cookies, all sorts of different ways. We took a load of coats down two weeks ago. All sorts of different ways that we can serve in this ministry if you want to be a part of that. Someone came up after the first service and went up to Kelly and says, I'm in. I don't know how I'm in, but I'm in. Just use me. And so, uh, so that's a great way to do that. Uh, and then probably the most important way we can help this ministry is through our prayers. And, you know, it's weird because it probably should have been the first thing I started with. Oftentimes we'll put that at the end. But that really is. This ministry, I believe, is succeeding because of the prayers of the saints. I mean, just... Many, many, many people lifting both Kelly and David up, but the ministry and the people of South Toledo up in prayer. And I think that's what empowers, no doubt in my mind, empowers this ministry is God's working through uh, them, but into that community, empowering the, these uh, folks. Uh, and when we get back in person, then we do our once a month worship and we do our once a month uh, uh, just getting to be with them. I mean, one of my best uh, remembrances, I have so many, I, could, I can't... Uh, I could go on and on, but I, could, I remember preaching. We'd do a, a, a sermon down there, and David would always remind me, you know, you got seven minutes for the message. I'd say, okay, fine. Uh, but I can remember one day I was, I was preaching, and Paul, I was talking about Paul. I forget, it was probably Philippians or something. I said, you know, Paul's in prison. You know what that'd be like? And one, one point, person, like sitting on the second row, said, I got out yesterday. I know exactly what I said. I said, yes, you do, brother. I mean, it was just so practical, you know. It's just wonderful, right? And so, uh, so a wonderful place to do ministry and uh, and, uh, and to love on people and, and, and have them love on you. So it's a, an incredible uh, ministry. So any last words for us? Yeah. So uh, in the video, you saw this large room. It's really kind of ornate and fallen ornate. Uh, that's going to be the gym. And uh, my passion is I want that gym um, to be paid for by Christians across the city of Toledo. And so it's about a half million dollars. Uh, we have uh, raised about 350 of that already from uh, 350,000 from other other churches and other Christians and so we've been out looking for a number of churches to, to do that $20,000 uh, help us raise that amount of money so we're almost there 
And uh, the, really, the, my intention in, in saying I want that gym memorialized by the churches is for the next 50 years, long after most of us are gone, I want kids that are there to come in and see a large plaque that we'll put up uh, on the entrance just saying that this, this space was provided by area Christians. And I think that would be a great testimony that will live long past our own lives. And so we just invite you to participate in that. Amen. Amen. You know, we had a training session yesterday for the church for about three hours on Zoom and uh, for the church leadership. And, and one of, the, one of the, the trainers said, uh, oftentimes dreaming like Jesus is simply fulfilling the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come. Uh, and I think that's what's happening at Mosaic. It's, it truly is uh, the kingdom's presence is there. And, uh, and so, and, 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 uh, and through a thousand different ways that happens. But a uh, big part of that is, is through your uh, generosity and your time, talents, and, and, and uh, money. So thank you for what you've done uh, in this ministry. And David and Kelly, thank you for what you do. Okay, let's, let's take a moment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful for uh, David and Kelly and the ministry uh, that you called them to years ago. I'm grateful to this congregation, Lord, the way that we have, have uh, been invited into this ministry and the way we have responded, uh, and, and through the countless hours of uh, uh, people who have given. Uh, and, and Lord, we are so grateful for our friends down in South Toledo. Uh, we are uh, grateful and privileged to walk beside these brothers and sisters uh, and, uh, and to see change come into their lives. And so, Lord, bless us, bless the endeavors of, of Mosaic, uh, bless those who are being served in this ministry uh, so that truly your kingdom might come on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we love you and we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thanks, guys. Thanks for being here.
Everything is a sacrifice Use me how you want to, God And have your throne within Pray with me, please. Lord, you know about that song uh, where the man is crying out, saying, God, uh, I look around me and I see all this homelessness and poverty and heartbreak and mental illness and addiction, and why don't you do something, Lord? And you say back in this song, I did. I created you. So we are called, Lord, to be your church. The world needs the light of your church, especially in these times. We thank you for examples like uh, Kelly and David that remind us that we need to step out in faith to respond to the needs that are there, to say yes, that God created us and God created the church to make the difference that is needed in our world. So Lord, however we are moved today, whether it's through our giving of, of resources or giving of time, Lord, if it's building up your church by deepening our faith through study, Lord, your church is meant to be building the kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Help us, Lord, to create a new image of what your church is to be. For we've, we've gotten a bit of a bad rap in recent years. So Lord, each of us has a role in, to play in that. So use us, Lord. We are available. Amen. Well, that deepening of our walk is what we want to do through this Lenten season. Um, it's a time to take a good look at where we are in our faith journey to better understand who Jesus is and what Jesus is calling us to do and to be. And so this series is called The Walk that we're doing through Lent. The sermons on Sunday morning will be based on that. Our devotions throughout the week on Facebook will have a Lenten theme. And we also will have a study to go along with this series where you'll get together with other people online and study the theme of that week and develop those practices that will strengthen your faith. Here's a video to tell you more about it. It's been proven that a daily brisk walk can help you live a healthier life, yet often it takes a health crisis for us to finally begin to get healthy. It's also true that a daily decision to walk with Jesus will help deepen our spiritual life. And yet it often takes a moral failure or some other life change to awaken us to the simple awareness that we're not where we want to be. Hi, I'm Adam Hamilton, and in my new book and Bible study experience, The Walk, we explore five essential spiritual practices that are aimed at helping us grow deeper in our walk with God. When practiced daily, these help us to know who God is, to experience His presence in our lives, to experience more vitality in the Christian life, and to be more effective in living out our faith in the world. I'd like to invite you to join me as we're exploring these five essential practices, disciplines, or exercises to grow in the Christian life. These practices are not rocket science, nor are they only for the spiritual masters. They're all taught in scripture, modeled by Jesus, and practiced by ordinary Christians over the last 2,000 years. To complement the book, we've created a six-week Bible study experience that includes a leader's guide, a DVD with sessions on each practice, and resources for the entire church. Join me as we explore these five essential spiritual practices so that we can together find a deeper, more fulfilling walk with Christ. So that walk, that Lenten journey begins this Wednesday with our Ash Wednesday service, which will be online and in person in the sanctuary. Um, that's, we begin the Lenten journey with repentance. And so the theme for that service is the walk prone to wander. So we do hope you'll participate in that. I am excited to share... Pastor Joni, can I ask a question? Certainly. If I was interested in being in that Bible study, how would I do that? Oh, you would go to um, the FYI Friday. There's a click on to sign up. You can go to the church website to do the same, or you can call the church office, and Cindy will get you signed up. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'm very excited because on Monday there was the completion of a very important course in the life of our church. There are seven individuals who applied, were interviewed, and chosen to be a part of our Stephen Ministry class. And all seven of, the, seven of them completed that class on, Saturday, on Monday after over 50 hours of training. And they are well prepared to do what Stephen ministers do, which is to walk one-on-one -on -one with a person going through a challenging season. Now, your challenge may be that you're just sick and tired of this pandemic and you're about to lose your your mind, um, and you just need somebody to talk to, or it can be something more, um, even more dramatic, such as the loss of a loved one or going through a crisis in, in your life, a loss of a job or a relationship issues or an illness. So Stephen ministers are trained to walk with you, to pray with you confidentially, to listen, and to be a special friend for you through that challenging season. So they are available. I'd like to introduce them to you. In addition to the ones that have already been commissioned a couple of years ago, we have Becky Jacobs. That's Bruce Robinson in the middle. He's one of the Stephen leaders. We have Alan Drown, Debbie Mills, Brian Cleland, Deborah Figueroa, Barb Bowers, and Sherry Hartman. Wonderful servants. Yes, give them your applause. They've worked very hard. They are amazing servants with a heart that aches for the same things that ache the heart of God, and they want to walk with you. So see me for more information about how you can be paired with one of these people or one of our previously trained people, um, and, and we will commission these individuals when we open up a little further. So thank you very much. God bless you as you go from this place. May the peace and love of Christ go with you. Amen. Jesus is the only name to remember. Jesus is the only.